every day yeah. From 1 in the morning till 12 the next day yeah. Strategy, RPG, FPS We can get to that stupid level 41 And a game called Super Magic Siren Blitz It takes 10 days for you to download it But once you go in, you can never come out You become the AI, your controls ass uh. While we're doing this, we're drinking our Mountain Dew Hot pockets in a microwave, they're warming up to him yeah. Don't care what you think or say yeah, about us Why? Because uh, You know that we're the best the rapping that I do, it's not its not meant to be taken like seriously. I do not want to go on concert tours or anything. Uh, this is just for the enjoyment of others and uh, see others smile. I'm Zuriel. I like anything nerdy. I love singing. And I love people. I was homeschooled for many years of my life, and I had a few close friends during these years, but I didn't really have a lot of a lot of friends, like as you would in high school. So I tried to find these groups at youth groups. So the first one was really small, and it just didn't help us connect because there wasn't very many people. And then when we went to the second one, there were so many people that there was a lot more clicks. And I did not fit the expectations of people there, and because I, I didn't want to change as much as other people wanted me to, so I, that means I didn't get to make a lot of friends that I could've. After the second youth group, we went to one more, and we went to this retreat. And we were worshiping, and I just felt this presence of being loved all around me, because I could tell that people, they were actually wanting to learn about God, and they actually wanted to care about me and other people. And that just made me, for the first time in my life, I think I was like truly happy. Shortly after this retreat, we were doing worship again in a group. I saw this image of an eye, and I heard or saw the word watch, and I was like, okay, this is something I want to write down. So I wrote it down, and then for a little bit I was trying to figure it out, and then at one point, my grandmother pointed me to a verse in the Bible, which is Proverbs 7, 2 through 4, which is, keep my commandments and live, keep my teachings as the apple of your eye, bind them on your fingers and write them on the tablet of your heart. And for me, this meant that the place where I'd found community, I needed to keep that and the things that I learned there as the apple of my eye. And I think ever since that point, I've had a different view on the things that have happened in my life. So ever since that experience I've had, I felt called to like hang out with anybody, and the younger kids especially too, because they can teach you a lot. And I know one way that you can connect with younger people is just to be funny and goofy. And I found out one day that if I, if I can talk like this and rap, the definition of nerd is imbued into the songs themselves. And I've really enjoyed making them. I think people like them. I also enjoy writing music as well. And a song that I wrote recently is about the verse Proverbs 7 through 2 about keeping God as the apple of your eye. I'm gonna take a breath Cause it reminds me how beautiful you are to me You're the one and only person I need Cause you are always kind to me I'm gonna take a breath Through all these experiences that I've had, I think God's helped me realize who I can be through Him. And He's helped me realize how my actions can affect others and how my actions can show His love to others. Even though I'm not perfect, the experiences that I've had in my life have changed me for the better, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share God's love. Oh, my heart is a tablet, and I will write your words apart, and I will follow your commandments, be the apple of my eye, the apple of my eye. Well, hello. Welcome to the Meeting House live stream. My name is Mark. I am one of the pastors here at the Meeting House and your host today. It is so good to be together. Thanks for joining us. You have joined us for week three of our Jesus Walks series. This morning we'll be hearing from Danielle, who will be continuing um, the challenge to uh, what it looks like to walk more like Jesus, to be more like Jesus. I know last week 
Um, we were challenged by Jimmy to, to walk with others, to eat with others, to uh, listen to others, and that's been such a good uh, challenge so far. I hope you were able to participate in that this past week, and I know this morning there are going to be new and fresh challenges for us, so welcome here. It's good to be together. Hey, if you um, are typically a part of a in-person gathering, maybe you're a part of one of our physical parishes here in the GTA, I just wanted to remind you, let you know that some of our parishes are beginning to regather again to meet in person again. And so if you are wondering if that's your parish, then you can go to uh, themeanyhouse.com slash locations for that information to look in to what your parish is doing, or you can go to your local social media channels and find that information as well. I just wanted to flag that. Although we love being together here in this space, you might want to uh, know a bit more about that, and that's awesome. Hey, at this point, we are going to um, head to uh, some musical worship, um, and so why don't we go there now um, with Rachel. You're here. Join us during this time of music. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like why.
There's a poem by John O'Donohue. It's from a book called To Bless the Space Between Us, a book of blessings. And it really speaks to this season that we've been in that feels so long and disheartening. It says, when the rhythm of the heart becomes hectic, time takes on the strain until it breaks. Then all the unattended stress falls in on the mind like an endless increasing weight. The light in the mind becomes dim. Things you could take in your stride before now become laborsome events of will. Weariness invades your spirit. Gravity begins falling inside you, dragging down every bone. The tide you never valued has gone out, and you are marooned on unsure ground. Something within you has closed down, and you cannot push yourself back to life. You've been forced to enter empty time. The desire that drove you has relinquished. There is nothing else to do now but rest and patiently learn to receive the self you have forsaken in the race of days. Your first, at first, your thinking will darken and sadness take over like listless weather. The flow of unwept tears will frighten you. You have traveled too fast over false ground. Now your soul has come to take you back. You take refuge in your senses, open up to all the small miracles you rushed through, become inclined to watch the way of rain, 
when it falls slow and free. Imitate the habit of twilight, taking time to open the well of color that fostered the brightness of day. Draw alongside the silence of stone until its calmness can claim you. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Stay clear of those vexed in spirit. Learn to linger around someone of ease who feels they have all the time in the world. Gradually, you will return to yourself, having learned a new respect for your heart and joy that dwells far within slow time. And so as I think of that and I think of God and what he's doing in this season, it's unique to each of us. But he is here and he is working. And I was just talking with someone about how God works slow, fast. Often it feels like he's doing nothing for so long. But then when he's ready, things move quickly and we will come back to ourselves and to each other and learn to appreciate what this season has been and what we learned and we'll look back and see that. And we can trust that that's true. We can trust God and what he's doing because he is our father. And he's doing a new thing like only he can. And there will be breakthrough. In the crushing in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking a new ground. And so I yield to you and to your careful hand. And when I trust you, I don't need to honor. Make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing but all that you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing,
Boy, I just love that line, Jesus bring new wine out of me. It uh, causes me to think about all of the different things that I've been storing up and holding on to. There was another line in that song that said, uh, I lay down my old flames, right? These things that we hold on to and they, uh, we carry them with us all the way along so often. And I was just challenged, you know, what, what mark do you need to lay down to Jesus today? Thank you, team and Rachel, for leading us. Uh, in that worship. That's so beautiful. One of those things that I have really uh, missed during this season, this long season of COVID, these different things that we have given up along the way, is connecting with people one-on-one, is going for a coffee or a drink with someone uh, to catch up, to connect, to hear a little bit about their life and share in life together. Well, this week, I was able to do that. Uh, One of those rare circumstances, I was able to sit down with Daryl Winger a senior pastor here at the meeting at the meeting house and hear a little bit about what he is reflecting on and we got to record that and uh, I want to share that with you this morning so let's go to that video now Hi, here with Daryl Winger, Senior Pastor of The Meeting House. Daryl, good to be together today. Uh, How are you doing? Thanks, Mark. Doing well. Thanks for having me. Great. Hey, Daryl, in this challenging season that we find ourselves in as a church at The Meeting House, uh, what what do you find yourself reflecting on? What are you learning and processing these days? Yeah, one of the... One of the um, uh, spiritual truths that I've been resonating with, wrestling with, mm. and thinking about is actually comes right out of Isaiah 43, mm. verse 19, one of my favorite passages of Scripture at any time, but I find it especially meaningful for me uh, and I believe for the church in difficult circumstances. As we- Hi. Hi, here with Daryl Winger, Senior Pastor of The Meeting House. Daryl, good to be together today. Uh, How are you doing? Thanks, Mark. Doing well. Thanks for having me. Great. Hey, Daryl, in this challenging season that we find ourselves in as a church at The Meeting House, uh, what... Okay, well, I guess um, I guess that was a conversation for just Daryl and I, so I apologize, but maybe we'll post that to social media down the road or figure that out for later. Um, just wondering, we had another clip. Are we going to be able to see that clip as well? Okay, no problem. So we're not. We're just going to keep going. Um, that's fine. That was just a really special time of hearing what Daryl's been reflecting on and being able to discuss that. And it it falls in line, and I'm amazed by this theme of newness, right, and what God is doing among us here. And so um, be looking for that, because that is an exciting um, exciting and thoughtful time of reflecting together. Hey, at this point, we are going to um, transition to our uh, opportunity to give. If you've been around at the Meeting House here for a while, you would know that we do this regularly. We uh, want to live and feel called to live generous lives, and one of those things that we do to live generous lives Uh, is to give, is to uh, participate in what God is doing here at the Meeting House through financial giving. And so um, if you call the Meeting House home, if this is a place where you, um, yeah, have landed and are feeling challenged and want to be a part of, I just want to encourage you to, um, yeah, to participate in that way, to walk that path and to... uh, to give. And if that is you, if you do want to be a part of that, you can go to themeaninghouse.com slash give uh, to get any information you need there. Okay, I am going to pray and then we're going to throw it over to Danielle for week three of Jesus Walks. Will you pray with me now? Jesus, thank you for your incredible uh, love for us. Thank you that you are among us no matter where we are, if we're at home, if we're in a coffee shop, if we're going for a walk, you are there. You are present You are at work. I just pray that you would give us eyes to see your hand at work, sensitive spirits to know where your spirit is moving. Jesus, in that um, you would remind us that as things feel new to us, as you are doing a new thing among us, that you would remind us that there is nothing new to you, that you are our foundation and that you are walking with us along this journey. We are so grateful for your love. We're so grateful for your presence with us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. Martin Luther King Jr. Our task must be to free ourselves by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. Albert Einstein. We must learn to regard people less in the light of what they do or omit to do and more in the light of what they suffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I would rather make mistakes in kindness and compassion than work miracles in unkindness and hardness. Mother Teresa. In compassion, when we feel the other, we dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and we put another person there. Karen Armstrong. God, show me the way because the devil's trying to break me down. Jesus walks with me, with me, with me. The only thing that I pray is that my feet don't fail me now. Kanye West. Hey friends, uh, what an incredible time we are in. If you're in Canada, in Toronto area at all, or in the greater Toronto area, you'll know it's freezing cold. And uh, I haven't seen this much snow probably since last winter or even before that, it's bad. And uh, I had a chance to unplug a little bit myself this month. And you know what they say, everything works better when it's been unplugged and plugged back in again. So here I am in the middle of this series, Jesus Walks, which I'm so excited about. Uh, first of all, to recognize that we are not serving a God who is idle or who is stuck or, you know, the prophet Isaiah said, who cannot hear and cannot move, who has no arms, who has no capacity. Jesus walks. In other words, there is a movement and Jesus invites us to this movement. Now, if you haven't heard of this series called The Chosen, it's an app you can download on your phone or you can watch it on YouTube. I've been having um, chosen watch parties at my house and uh, I've been watching this series for the last couple of years. It's one of the first ever TV kind of form, short form uh, episodes, but long form storytelling around the life of Jesus and the gospel stories and the life really of the disciples of Jesus. So I was interested when we talk about walking with Jesus and we start participating in the life of Jesus, there is this beautiful, if you haven't checked this out, I encourage you to check it out. It's a very fascinating storytelling, really good storytelling about the life of Jesus. But I was a big, big fan of this thing. I knew Jesus Walk series was coming up. And then I got this email asking me if I would like to go meet Jesus. <laughs> and by Jesus, I mean Jonathan Rumi, the, the man who plays Jesus. And so I was like, I'm going to do my proper preach prep for the meeting house. Like, it's time for me to really go do a deep dive. And we're talking about Jesus Walks. I actually went and walked with Jonathan, who plays Jesus in the series. And actually, I was part of a document, a filming of a documentary just on his life and how playing Jesus has impacted his life. So there I am. You see me in Phoenix, Arizona with Jesus. We just walked for several hours in the desert with mics on and recording our conversation. But uh, just talking through the ramifications of what it means for his life to have played Jesus. Now, The Chosen is a hit a global hit, like hundreds of millions of people have watched it and downloaded it and shared it. And it's been crowdsourced. So it's been funded by people who watch it. It's just like sign in a wonder, like no one in Hollywood knows what to do with this thing. And, uh, and what it's done for Jonathan is it's completely changed his life in so many ways. Uh, first of all, just the recognition that it's brought him. He'll be uh, in places all over the world. People will come up and ask him to heal them. Uh, he said he's had some awkward conversations where people have come and knelt before him. And he's like, look, dude, I'm an actor, you know, like my, <laughs> but he is a Jesus follower. And so the conversation I had with Jonathan was really reminded me of all of the, this call to discipleship, this call to discipleship. The apostle Paul put it like this, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that word imitate is actually what a really good actor will do is put themselves in to the story, put themselves into the character of the story. And that's what Jonathan Romy has done is put himself in 
to the character of Jesus, and it has completely impacted his life. And he said, you know, it kind of has both. It's like, one, I feel so so much gratitude for being called into this place. But then he said the other thing that it's done is really put a lot of like pressure. I feel like I don't want to let people down. I don't want to let people down. And as we were talking, I said, you know, I think every follower of Jesus feels that way. I think yours is just more public, but we all feel that way. One, just this incredible gratitude that Jesus walks with us, that Jesus invites us to walk with him, that Jesus, not some static theological faith or principle that we're trying to live up to, but a presence, a person that invites us into relationship, into a, a walking, into a movement, more and more and more towards life and towards freedom and towards connection with God. But also this incredible pressure that we have to live up to. We don't want to disappoint people. We don't want to come out as Jesus followers and then be like those Jesus followers who are not enough and uh, not living up to Jesus. And so I feel like there's just so much to learn in that deep dive, even with Jonathan uh, Rumi, he talked to me uh, about how devoted he was as a child to Jesus. He grew up in a Catholic setting, but he said he was so taken. When he was like 10 or 11, his parents just believed, thought he might be a priest. You know, he was just lent himself. He really wanted to know Jesus. He said he remembers around 11 years old during Easter time, he would take a cross. He made a cross out of these two by fours in his backyard, put nails, made it and put it into like this concrete base. And he said, he's just 11. He'd sat up on this base and he just put himself in the place, his fingers where the nails were, you know, just put himself in the place of the cross and said to Jesus, like, I want to know you. I want to know you. And then he said, I didn't remember that for years. He went off the rails and he came back to faith and then now finds himself playing Jesus. And he said, as he was, as this pressure was mounting in his life, he remembered, he flipped back to this memory he had when he was 11, when he said he wanted to know Jesus. And uh, then he was filled with gratitude to say, oh, I see, this is God answering my prayer. I'm knowing Jesus now, entering into his life in a new way. And in so many ways, this is, this whole series is about that. Not just that Jesus walked, but that Jesus invites us to walk with him. I thought Quincy did such a great job opening the series. If you hadn't had a chance to go back to that, just the slowing of the pace, Jimmy reminding us the next week that uh, Jesus didn't have to walk. As a matter of fact, a lot of rabbis and a lot of leaders and a lot of kings would be carried. And actually it would be beneath them to walk because walk is what peasants would do or people of lower socioeconomic backgrounds would do. But Jesus walked, which itself is saying that he lowered himself. He wants to be accessible to people who would not normally have leaders or teachers or accessible uh, to, uh, to them. And so this is the posture of Jesus. I also am still recovering from Jimmy's suggestion last week that Jesus shape shifts. And if you don't know that, go back to that preach and watch it again. He didn't say that specifically, but that's what happened, where Jesus appears to the disciples post-resurrection as a stranger and their posture with the stranger is what opens their eyes, the eyes of their hearts. So their hearts are burning within them. This is Jesus. And of course the direct reference in my mind went to the uh, gospel, Matthew 25, that chapter famous pas pa uh, passage called the sheep and the goats, where it talks about this judgment. And I, it always scared me that passage of scripture until I sort of saw it really through the lens of Jesus, that their, their invitation, so many of us want to touch God. We want to connect with God. We want to connect our faith in real life. We want to feel God's presence with us. And Matthew 25 and Jesus's example in the Emmaus walk uh, says what we do to the least of these, how we engage in the world, how we make room for others uh, is how we will engage with Jesus. That's how that that sensation of having spent time with Jesus is having connected to God. It's going to happen through our willingness to open our lives to the least of these. In Matthew 25, the scriptures say that whatever you did to the least of these, you did to Jesus, you know, and there's just, there's a supernatural principle at work. This week, I want to talk about how Jesus walks towards suffering and death. Jesus walks towards suffering and death. And we're going to use a passage of scripture from Luke chapter 7, um, and there's a few of these passages of scripture. This is the, like one, this wow factor is off the charts, right? This is like, wow, whoo, goes way off the charts because this is the raising of a dead son. Okay. This is the raising of a dead person. So this is all like, you know, Hollywood. And uh, there's a few things about this. I'm going to read the passage of scriptures from Luke chapter seven, starting at verse 11. And, uh, and then I'm going to share with you some goodies and then what I'm calling the circle of compassion or the movement circle of compassion that Jesus invites all of us 
to walk with him in. So here we go. This is Luke 7, 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the buyer they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Wow. Okay, so there's so many things happening here. So many things. Uh, and a couple just quick things before we move into, get into this movement. But the first, uh, the town called Nain, um, it, it, the word actually means beautiful. And apparently there's a really beautiful view from that town. But it's actually not significant a uh, town enough to have a wall, a gate around it. So... It, it, that's sort of a sense of significance when a town has a fortified uh, gate. It's meant to uh, show its importance. Uh, it does, it's not important enough to have one of those in history. So Nain is a small town, beautiful. His disciples are just passing through. And as he approaches the town gate, which is why he can see, because there's no, there's no actual fortified wall, as he ap approaches the town, he sees this uh, procession, this funeral procession. And actually, what's really interesting about this is Jesus sees the widow. Now, traditionally, the widow, the reason this is the case is because the widow would have led the procession. The widow goes first, and then it would be the, the casket, the open um, casket, be covered with a sheet. There'd be a bri what we call a briar, which is like a, a, a wooden slat, basically, with the body on it, and the body would be covered by a cloth. And, um, but Jesus doesn't see the young man first. He sees the widow and what's really interesting, too, in this text is, is the word Jesus sees the widow. So that word see, uh, it matters. It matters. Jesus sees uh, that one of the first people who sees God and names God in the scriptures from Genesis, and it's a woman named Hagar. And Hagar, again, similar to this woman, on a pecking order of social standing, she's at the bottom. So she's an oppressed person. Uh, and oppressed by the people of God. She's been brought in and made a handmaid, basically, cue handmaid's tale. Like, it's kind of a little bit like that. She's been forced to, ha to get pregnant and then been treated horribly and discarded from the community. So she runs away from the community and she's stuck in the desert. And she basically cries out saying, like, we're going to die. And the scripture says that the Lord comes to her and says, I see you. You matter to me. I have a future for you. Prophesies the future of her and her son and tells her to go back to the people of God. When Hagar goes back to the people of God, she says, I, I, I've seen God. And they say, who is this God? Who is the God that you saw? And she said, I have seen the God who sees me. <laughs> And L. L. Roy, it's, it's one of the most beautiful passages or one of the most beautiful namings of God in scripture, right back then from Genesis. I have seen the one who sees me. And I think uh, before we get into like how we participate with Jesus in this compassion movement, I think it's important for you to know wherever you are right now in your life, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter how grim it is, uh, you might be leading a procession of your own. Uh, a grief procession. You might be leading just this like progression of death, maybe a death to a dream, maybe a death to self, maybe a death to a relationship, uh, maybe physical grief. And you need to know right from the get-go that Jesus doesn't walk by you. He stops. This, this is just who Jesus is. Jesus stops and he sees you. You are not alone. You are not alone. Jesus sees you. So that happens, and, and his heart went out to her is what the scripture says, and he said, don't cry. Now, the idea of not crying is not about saying you're not supposed to grieve. It's that Jesus has something else in mind. Jesus has something else in mind. A couple things to keep in mind. Um, one, Jesus came, 
And the way that Jesus walks on the earth is towards, he's not afraid of dealing with uh, hard topics. Jesus is not afraid of anything. He's not afraid of suffering and he's not afraid of death. In our context and in that context, we are. We are afraid of suffering. We are afraid of death. And this is one of the things that Jesus comes to do is to break off that fear and to invite us into a different kind of way of life. So I want to walk through this as a progression of how we walk with Jesus towards suffering and death without being consumed by suffering and death. So the first thing is to recognize what, I would, what I'm calling fatalism. Okay, I'm calling this fatalism. And I think fatalistic teaching has kind of, uh, or fatalistic thinking has taken over our world in so many ways. Um, fatalism, let me think of one of the worst examples of fatalism uh, is like a caste system in India where people are just like stuck in their systems of, of socioeconomics and in their value system and it's just like their fate. This is their fate. It's rooted in this idea of reincarnation. They must have done something in their previous life to deserve it and they're working their way off. This is how they work their way off. And what it does is it leaves people in these systems that they can't get out of. But lest we blame it on that, we could actually even take a look at fatalistic uh, theology, you know, that practiced in apartheid, for example, where uh, there was this idea that God had predetermined people's worth and positions in society based on the color of their skin. And so literally the theologians of the apartheid movement or theologians in America of slavery or theologians that use this kind of predeterminism of God to keep people stuck in their positions, in their standings in the world is fatalistic theology. And it only ever leads to death and suffering that has a final word. I'm with Jesus on this one. I can't stand that. I can't stand it. And you can see fatalism le uh, leaking into our world in a couple different ways. I think a lot of times we'll be like, well, God will make it happen if God wants it to happen. That's a fatalistic uh, theology that needs to be like banned to hell. <laughs> uh, if God wanted to make it happen, it would happen, is not a useful or Jesus-based theology. It's a fatalistic one. And what it does is it creates a passivity. And uh, it creates a passivity in us, and it creates a passivity in the world. I remember reading a book called Life the Movie by Neil Gabler. He wrote about 20 years ago. And he talks about how um, the culture of entertainment that we've created, social media and just the sheer um, uh, entertainment has created sort of a passive spectator role in us in life. Um, and he, he, he cites, and this is fascinating 20 years ago, I don't know what it is today, but I know then the fastest growing crimes were not active crimes, they were passive crimes. In other words, they were people that witnessed things. Maybe they were at a party and they witnessed something happening that was not okay, or they're somewhere and they witnessed something happen, but they wouldn't do anything about it. They didn't intervene. They didn't step in. They didn't call the police. They didn't report it. And so there was this massive influx 20 years ago of passive crimes, of people who refused to do something. And I think it's this fatalistic, he says it's because we've created spectators, not participants. I think this is true. If I'm honest in my own life, if I was in this situation with Jesus, I don't know what I would do. I know that I probably wouldn't just be fatalistic about it. Like this is what it is and there's nothing to be done about it. I would probably move out of fatalism to what I call sympathy. That's, I think the first move out of fatalism is towards sympathy. Um, sympathy is this, I feel sad for you. I feel sad for you. At least there's some kind of heartfelt, you know, we're not distancing ourselves in fatalistic thinking. At least there's some sort of movement. Sympathy is, I feel sad for you. That's better than I feel like, well, too bad for you, right? Too bad for you. There's nothing I can do about this. To, I feel bad for you. And there is a sense in which this is happening here. There's a procession, people, and you can feel wherever there's a procession of death, whether it's like on a generation or whether it's on an issue or whether it's on a people or whether it's on the outcome of whatever it is, this dream that we had and we're dying to this dream, whatever it is, there's a sympathy, there's grief, and that's natural and that's good. I feel bad for you. But as many people will tell us to actually break fatalism, this inevitable cycle of death, we not only have to have sympathy, we have to move beyond sympathy into empathy. 
Now, the difference between sympathy and empathy is subtle but really significant. So sympathy says, I feel sad for you. Empathy said, I'm sad with you. So again, we're moving closer and closer and closer in the way of Jesus when we re reject fatalism, we move in sympathy, I feel sad for you. Then we move towards empathy. Wait a minute, this is no longer about how I feel. This is about how you feel and me entering into your story. We can see some of the elements of this uh, happening in Jesus, right? We see some of the elements of this happening in Jesus when he sees the woman. He feels now her pain. He feels he has, he's moved towards identifying with what that might feel like for that woman, for her future, for her possibility of what's going to happen to her next, for her lack of provision in her life, for this total like uh, uh, tragedy of circumstances for her. But that's not quite enough. Now, Brené Brown, if you study any of Brené Brown's work, you'll know she'll, she has great teaching on the difference between sympathy and empathy. And if you look at the message notes, you'll see that there's, a, there's some uh, TED Talks there and there's a couple of links in those notes that you can, if you want some further teaching on sort of how to move out of fatalism to sympathy into empathy and the differences between the two. Uh, that simplified version is one. But Jesus goes beyond that. And I mean, I think this is one of the, one of the coolest things about Jesus, to tell you the truth, is that he is not just sympathetic and he is not just empathetic, which is more powerful than sympathy. He is compassionate. And compassion is the way that we don't only just confront fatalism, but we change the direction forever. We change the direction. Now, Jesus is moved with compassion. Now, let me break that down for you. In this passage of scripture, the word for compassion is now, I'm going to try to say this. Say this with me. This will be a fun exercise. Splagnozomai. Now, your homework is to work splagnozomai into a conversation this week. That'll be fun. Okay, just kind of work it in. See if you can't get it in there. Splagnozomai. And actually, the word, that's the word that's used for compassion in this. When it says his heart went out, he had compassion for her. Jesus had splagnozomai for her. And it means literally to be moved as to one's bowels. Now, my husband had a band when he was a teenager uh, called the, the Cellophane Rappers. <laughs> and he has a classic hit. Uh, and it was this, when you got to go, you got to go. When you got to go, you got to go. When you got to go, you got to go straight to the bathroom. <laughs> right? To be moved towards, when you got to go, you better get out of my way. I got to get there. You know what I'm saying? Anyone been there? Like, I got to, when you got to go, you got to go. This is the feeling that Jesus had. When you got to go, you got to go. When you have to confront fatalism, when you have to move all the way uh, to sympathy, to empathy, and then to compassion. I have got to do something. I cannot just stand idly by. And Jesus is moved. This is how Jesus walks towards suffering and death because he's not afraid of it. Because suffering and death doesn't have the final word anymore. Jesus came to confront death and he came to actually move to comfort those who are suffering. And this is what we see quite literally. Jesus moved towards now, a couple things about this that are really important to keep in mind from this text. Jesus steps to stop the procession of death. That itself is, I think, such a cool move. I mean, and dangerous move, right? I mean, some people would say this is not respectful, right? Some people would say this is like not respectful. He's interrupting this death march and he touches the briar, the scripture says. Now, that's a really big deal because if you were religious and if you understood the religious implications of touching dead bodies, you would know that this instantly is supposed to make Jesus unclean. This is supposed to make Jesus unclean. Of course, we know it doesn't because the transfer with Jesus is different. So what Jesus does is what he touches becomes clean right? It's the opposite transference. The things that he's touching don't make him unclean. The things he's touching make those things clean. <laughs> That's the power that Jesus has. That's what compassion can do. He's not afraid to become unclean because the compassion, the love of God that's in him can not only stop death, but speak a better word entirely. This is what it means to be moved to step in. I remember many, many years ago in a town Williams Lake, I was living in northern British Columbia. It's, I'm reminded of the town because of the weather. <laughs> it was that cold there. 
And I remember I was running at the time. I was training for a marathon, so I was running no matter what the weather was. And I, 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 at the end of my uh, run, I, I timed it so that at the end of my run, I ran down this big hill just before I got to my house, which is always a cool way to go because you always feel like you're a rock star when you're running downhill, right? Like, I'm like, I'm amazing. I'm running downhill. And on my way down the hill, I passed this guy standing at a bus stop. His name is Clarence. Clarence was, I guess, like what the town, the, he's kind of the town drunk. He was, he was an indigenous man who had suffered a lot in his life. And he was always inebriated and kind of the kind of inebriated that is like, um, you know, mouthwash kind, you know, Listerine kind, like just really far gone. And, um, and I knew Clarence. Clarence used to come to church sometimes. Actually, he was one of my favorite hecklers. Whenever my husband was preaching, he would always shout out, that's garbage, don't listen, that's garbage. And we'd have to like escort him out. But whenever I was preaching, he used to shout out, you're beautiful, <laughs> you're beautiful. And I'd be like, someone get that guy a seat in the front, you know. So anyway, Clarence and I had this relationship. And uh, so I passed him and I said hi and he said hi. And I ran down the hill to finish my run. And when I got to the bottom of the hill, I felt the spirit of God speak to me. I, don't, I felt a movement inside of me. And I felt like God said to me, if Clarence goes to the park, which is where all of his buddies drank, and that's where he was, he was standing at the bus stop to get to the park, I knew that. He said, if Clarence goes to the park today, he's going to die. That's what I felt. I felt this, and I can't really explain it to you, but I felt this urgency. And I felt the Spirit of God invite me to go back up the hill and get Clarence and invite him over instead. And I was like, I remember at the time just going like, could you not have spoken to me at the top of the hill? Because <laughs> I had just finished my run and now I have to climb up this hill. But anyway, I climb up the hill and I say to Clarence, Clarence, I feel like you shouldn't go to the park today. Do you want to come to my house instead? And Clarence looked at me and he goes, I thought you'd never ask. You know, he's just so excited to come with me. So I remember trying to help Clarence, who's inebriated. Remember when I saw him, he's hanging on this bus stop. And I remember trying to help him down this slushy, icy hill. And him kept, he kept slipping because he's an eBay. I'm trying to hold him up at the end of my run. And he keeps slipping in this gutter. And I remember just like half, half, halfway down that hill, I just grabbed him by the scruff of the neck. And I just was like, you were not born for the gutter. You were not born for the gutter. You were not born for the gutter. In as much as society will tell us that it's inevitable that suffering and injustice and even systemic things can't change, that, it, that death has the final word, that suffering is just ending in death and that's it. Like as much as society will tell us there's nothing we can do, as much as we're inclined to spectate instead of to participate, as much as we're inclined just to be like, I'm out, this is too hard. Uh, wow, Jesus' power and the spirit of God is filling us to stop the procession of death in our own minds, in our own lives, in our own relationships, and in our society. We are not people who have to be afraid of suffering, and we are not people who let death have the final word. We are resurrection people. We are people who stand in the way of processions of death and, uh, and this, is, this is what Jesus is inviting us to walk with him. Can you imagine being a disciple, just kind of going through all your religious, like, ah, I don't think you're supposed to touch that. I don't think you're supposed to do that. I don't think this is safe. I don't think this is whatever. I mean, fill in the blank. You know, we just, we have so many ways of agreeing with death in our culture, but I'm out of agreement with death. Death is uh, an enemy that has been defeated. Uh, when they led Bonhoeffer to the gallows in Germany after, uh, just before the end of World War II, his jailer said to him, I guess this is the end. And Bonhoeffer said, oh, no, my friend, this is only the beginning. Death doesn't have the final word. This is why it's so cool to walk with Jesus, because Jesus is not afraid. And he's not afraid to enter in. He has sympathy. He has empathy. And even more than that, he has compassion. This is how Jesus walks in the world. And this is how Jesus invites us to walk in the world as well. I'm going to just end with this prayer, and the prayer is on the screen if you want to pray it with me. But I do actually want to invite you this week to start identifying those places that you're scared to touch, those places that are processions of death in your own life, in your own experience, in your own culture, in your own setting, and walk with Jesus to stop it and to speak a different word, another word, a better word, a word of life, a word of compassion, 
a word that moves us to action. Let's pray. Sovereign Lord, things in this world are not as you would have them to be. Violence and evil are so active in our world today. And I know that love and compassion are necessary combatants against these. Please give me a heart full of kindness and mercy for those who are around me and use me to tear down the strongholds of darkness. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Danielle. There was so much there. We are resurrection people. I'm done agreeing with death. We are not born for the gutter. I don't know uh, which words uh, that Danielle spoke this morning that you need to hear, but I just pray that you would let them resonate with you. Let them change you. Hey, if you um, were with us before the teaching, you know that we tried to show a video of a conversation between Daryl and I. Well, we are going to try that again. Um, so let's, let's show this video of this conversation between Daryl and I from this past week. Hi, here with Daryl Winger, senior pastor of The Meeting House. Daryl, good to be together today. Uh, How are you doing? Thanks, Mark. Doing well. Thanks for having me. Great. Hey, Daryl, in this challenging season that we find ourselves in as a church at The Meeting House, uh, what, what do you find yourself reflecting on? What are you learning and processing these days? Yeah, one of the, one of the uh, spiritual truths that I've been resonating with, wrestling with, mm. and thinking about is actually comes right out of Isaiah 43, mm. verse 19, one of my favorite passages of Scripture at any time, but I find it especially meaningful for me uh, and I believe for the church in difficult circumstances, as well as the fact that we're launching into a new year. Mm. And here are the words from Isaiah 43, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? And what I hear Jesus saying to me as I look at that passage again is, uh, are his words, look for me, hmm. look for me, mm -hmm. even in the most difficult of circumstances, stressful circumstances, yeah. for ver a variety of reasons, uh, Jesus is saying, Daryl, look for me at yeah. work, yeah. look for my presence, uh, look for me at work in the church. And um, yeah, I'm just really, that's what I'm reflecting on these days. Wow, what a beautiful challenge, right? I think sometimes when we find ourselves in all sorts of circumstances um, and we feel alone or abandoned by God, we, we wonder why, why have you left us when the challenge is uh, look, look for where am I at work already? What is the Holy Spirit doing um, through others in your community that yeah. you can join, that you can be a part of? Yeah, no, that's very true. Uh, hard circumstances mm -hmm. do not mean that Jesus has left the building. Mm. Uh, mm. Jesus is with us. He promises to be with us. He promises not to leave us, not to forsake us. And the challenge for us is to look for him yeah. and to perceive his presence. Wow. Yeah. So then let me ask, what, as you are leading and processing things here at the church, where do you see God at work? Where, When he says, look for me, Daryl, where do you see Jesus at work here mm -hmm. in the meeting house? Yeah. Well, I am reminded that we are a church with a vision, mm. reaching spiritually curious people, inviting them to the Jesus-centered life. And I see that we are continuing to pursue that vision. I see it through the effectiveness of our live stream ministry yeah. over the mm. last 18 months. Yeah. We have Often we have 6,000 downloads and views of our live right. stream yeah. and people connecting around the world as well as across all of our parishes. Mm. Uh, I see I see Jesus at work through our home churches. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that we have 1,800 people <laughs> connected to home churches, 119 wow. home churches wow. across all of our parishes. Yeah. Yeah. It's and as you know, some of them are, are global. Yeah, that's right. Many are global. And if you want more information about home church, go to themeetinghouse.com slash home church. Can I make that plug? Is that okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Because it's worth it. Yeah, we welcome people, but yeah. that's significant. And I see God at work in the creative approaches that our parishes are taking mm. to gather and ministry this fall yeah. uh, and as we head into the new year with yeah. some of the restrictions hopefully yeah. soon uh, going to uh, be lifted uh, there's a sense of innovation and creativity mm. that uh, is happening more and more across the, the meeting house and I see that's another sign yeah. that Jesus is at work yeah. among us. Wow that's so encouraging so many different ways and places that God is at work here among us mm -hmm. well thanks for spending time um, 
with me today. It's been so great. I'm glad that we are going to be continuing these conversations, that we're going to be having them regularly um, for all of us to take part in. Take care. Okay, as you just heard, um, we are going to be doing that regularly. It is, um, yeah, it's, it's something that I really want for all of us is to be hearing from Daryl and from our senior leaders uh, more regularly. And so you will be uh, hearing conversations like that more in the future. But we were a little bit stuck because I think that it is important if we're going to do something regularly to name it, right? It's not official unless it has a name. But we couldn't come up with a name for this little conversation with Daryl. And so uh, we didn't know this at the time, but we were having a little conversation about what to call these conversations. Um, and we have a little clip. And if you have any ideas about maybe uh, what we could call this coffee time with Daryl or something, feel free to put that in the chat or send me an email at live at the house.com and we will um, choose one of those names, whatever it is that pops the most. But here were some of our ideas. Wanted to show you those first. Okay, so Daryl, I was thinking of some names for this little segment. Yeah. And what do you think of debating Daryl? Debating Daryl, no. Disagreeing with Daryl? How about learning from Daryl? Learning from Daryl, that's okay, but it no, doesn't no. quite roll off the tongue. I really like this name, it might be my favorite. Dine and Dash with Daryl. Dine and Dash. Maybe we move this to like a restaurant. Maybe it's like a Dine and Dash with Daryl. Hmm. I'm... I'm I'm fine with whatever you think is best. <laughs> not debate, though, because it's not a debate. Well, no, I guess not disagreeing, then. We're You've around the word, brother. Yeah. We're around the <laughs> word. I want to read from the scriptures. Okay, so I couldn't convince him to go with dine and dash with Daryl. And let me be clear, I am not advocating for anyone to dine and dash at all. In fact, go support your local restaurants. But um, that was just some of the conversation. And I wonder if discerning with Daryl would be another good name. So feel free to... Add that to the chat and we will figure that out. Hey, it's been a really great time together today. Uh, humanity and all, right? Those ups and downs and we figured it out together. I uh, just want to remind you, if you are processing some of those words, some of those things that Danielle was uh, talking about this morning, those powerful words, then I would encourage you, and we talked about this in the video, go join a home church. Don't do this alone. The time is now to join a home church. You can go to themediahouse.com. You see it on your screen slash home church for all of that information, whether it's an online group or an in-person or a combination group. Um, the time is now. Today is the best day to join one of those groups. Hey, I'm praying for you. I'm cheering you on. I'm so glad that we are in this together. We'll see you next time. Godspeed. Take care.